What is up, y'all? I'm Andy Story with Wild Lumens, and today we're going to discuss coffee and how it applies to the carnivore diet. Is this something you should get rid of? Is this something that you should take on the daily? These are questions that a lot of people have, and hopefully I can help you get closer to an answer for yourself by sharing some of the things that the top carnivore diet advocates and doctors out there are saying. I'm talking about Dr. Sean Baker, Dr. Paul Saladino, and Judy Cho, as well as a couple of opinions and things to mention from carnivore diet advocate and influencer Carnivore Aurelius. So in this video, we're gonna see what they have to say, and then at the end of the video, I'm gonna share a little bonus material with you where you'll be able to receive a significant discount on what I believe to be the top coffee brand out there. So I get a lot of my information from the books that I read and some of my favorite books regarding the carnivore diet are The Carnivore Code by Dr. Paul Saladino, The Carnivore Diet by Dr. Sean Baker, and of course Carnivore Cure by Nancy Cho. I'm basically going to be reading off some of the important information and tidbits found within these books by these people. These are opinions coming from them, not from me. I'm gonna go ahead and put the links to these three books below, so be sure to check them out when you get a chance. But first up, I kinda wanna talk about what Dr. Paul Saladino has to say. I'm just going to be reading from the book and uh, you guys will have a good idea of what coffee is all about according to him. As we've learned previously, the seeds of plants often harbor some of the most dangerous toxins and coffee beans are no exception to this rule. They contain polyphenols, caffeic acid, and chlorogenic acid that have been found to damage DNA at levels present in a single cup. In his paper on plant pesticides, Bruce Ames notes, roasted coffee is known to contain 826 volatile chemicals, 21 have been tested chronically, and 16 are rodent carcinogens. Caffeic acid, a non-volatile rodent carcinogen, is also present. A typical cup of coffee contains at least 10 milligrams of rodent carcinogens. Further on down, Dr. Saladino mentions, coffee polyphenols act as pro-oxidants in the human body and trigger the NRF2 pathway, which leads to the formation of increased amounts of glutathione. These increased amounts of glutathione can make it look like oxidative stress parameters improve in the short term. But just like isothiocyanates, the polyphenols in coffee have also been shown to damage DNA and are going to have damaging effects in other parts of the body as well. Most people who drink coffee, caffeine is a valuable part of the package, but this molecule is designed by plants as a defense compound. It's a phytoalexin placed in seeds by the coffee plant to deter animals from eating them. Plants don't want their babies to get eaten. Though it would take a heck of a lot of coffee to kill you, about 75 cups, caffeine does have a lethal dose in humans. Drinking a few cups of coffee a day may result in addiction, however, can exert negative physiologic effects in humans, including raising heart rate, blood pressure, blood glucose, and the subjective experience of acute anxiety. Caffeine addiction has also been linked to chronic depression and anxiety, and withdrawal from this substance can be quite unpleasant. Now, he also mentions, unless we're drinking organic coffee, we're also getting a decent dose of man-made pesticides with that cup of joe. Coffee crops are highly sprayed with pesticides like glyphosate and 2-4-D, both of which have been linked to cancer and have been shown to disrupt human biochemistry. There was also a class action lawsuit against one of the uh, pesticide manufacturers and agricultural companies, which most people know about, and we were talking billions of dollars in damages. Glyphosate is a nasty substance. Now, after coffee has been harvested, the beans are often stored during processing for long periods of time, during which they can become moldy and contaminated with mycotoxins, including okra toxins A and B, penicillic acid, citronine, fumonosin, fumonisin, and aflatoxin. All of these are known to damage DNA in humans and have been linked to both brain and kidney toxicity. What wet processing of coffee beans may be, 
may decrease levels of mold toxin, but this is rarely done. So those are a few of the negative ideas surrounding coffee. And then he later goes on to answer the question. So when it comes to beverages on a carbivore diet, what should we drink? Pardon me if this sounds pedestrian, but how about good old fashioned water? This is what our ancestors have been drinking for the last 4 million years with perhaps a bit of blood mixed in there as well. When we return to the simple approach, good quality water becomes a fundamentally thirst quenching and enjoyable experience. It is worthwhile to consider drinking higher quality water that, than the fluoride, chlorine, or pharmaceutical enriched liquid that comes straight out of our faucets. My personal preference is spring water from a source that is regularly tested for contaminants. I went ahead and made a video on how my brother harvests water up in Idaho, and I do the same when I can find them locally wherever I'm living in the particular time. So check out that video here. Basically, the opinion of Dr. Saladino is to exclude caffeine and coffee from your diet. Let's go on and see what Judy Cho has to say in Carnivore Cure. So some notes that I took. Judy Cho goes on to say caffeine has some benefits. It can provide you with more energy, focus, and mitigate the worst effects of an alcohol hangover. Coffee also acts as a diuretic and may suppress appetite. It can also increase the body's basal meta metabolic rate, meaning it'll help the body burn fat. But caffeine can also cause acute anxiety and panic attacks. People who fast intermittently can sometimes experience muscle aches from caffeine withdrawal, not because of an electrolyte imbalance. Some people who give up caffeine believe that taking taurine supplements help counter the effects of caffeine withdrawal. They could be right. Taurine can mitigate anxiety and even support brain function. Human studies show that caffeine produces some reinforcing effects that are similar to those of amphetamines and cocaine. Caffeine also wakes up the adrenals to produce more cortisol. When you drink diuretics like coffee instead of water, you also run the risk of becoming dehydrated. The general rule of hydration is to drink half your body weight of fluid ounces. Additionally, if you drink diuretic, you should also drink the equivalent amount in water. Otherwise, you are risking dehydration. Caffeine also depletes magnesium. So make sure you eat magnesium-rich foods daily if you're a regular coffee or caffeine drinker. Because of the way coffee is grown, it can harbor a mold. If you have mold sensitiv sensitivities, reducing coffee may help. Some studies show that the amount of caffeine in a cup of coffee reduces blood flow to the brain by 22 to 30%. Caffeine, tannin, and flavonoid antinutrients in coffee can also interfere, interfere with the absorption of vitamins and minerals. Stop drinking coffee or caffeinated drinks with meals. One study found that a mean dose of 250 milligrams of caffeine, a cup has 95 milligrams, produced approximately 30% decrease in whole brain cerebral blood flow. Caffeine reduced CBF by an average of 20% across both caffeine states. One study gave participants 300 milligrams of coffee, about three cups in the morning, and no other caffeine for the rest of the day. The study subjects still experienced some disruption of sleep at night. Caffeine can exacerbate sleep issues for people who are sleepless because of stress. Caffeine decreases stage three and stage four sleep, which is 20% of our sleeping time and some of our most restful and restorative sleep. The, ca the half-life of caffeine is four to five hours, but varies by individual. If you use birth control, the half-life of caffeine doubles, stays longer in your body. Smokers process caffeine twice as quickly, so the half-life of caffeine for them is two to two and a half hours. Weight is another variable for half-life of caffeine. Decaffeinated coffee is not an ideal alternative. To remove caffeine, coffee beans are washed in solvents before roasting. Methylene chloride, also used in paint strip strippers, is so toxic that in 2016, the EPA proposed the ban of selling products by methylene chloride. Decaf is also not caffeine free. A standard cup of decaffeinated coffee can still have one to seven milligrams of caffeine which is more caffeine than some caffeinated teas have. She goes on to say that you should try removing caffeine from your diet and you may finally break free from the addictive grips of caffeine. Your adrenals will thank you for it. So obviously, Judy Cho, not a fan of coffee and caffeine. Now, what does Dr. Sean Baker have to say? All right, so Dr. Sean Baker says, coffee is something I have little experience with. I've tried a few cups here and there over the decades but I've never enjoyed it. Perhaps if you're a coffee lover, my inexperience is reason enough for you to stop listening to me. Many people find coffee incredibly satisfying and often turn to drinking it into a ritualistic experience. The science on whether coffee is good or bad for us continually changes. 
Caffeine has some effects on our physiology and acts as a central nervous system stimulant. It also affects the sympathetic nervous system and has been shown to aid in sports performance. However, research has found that it leads to sleep disturbance and can negatively affect gastrointestinal motility and gastric acid secretion. Some people find that caffeine acts, as, acts to dysregulate appetite, often suppressing it. It may interfere with nutrient and mineral absorption. In all likelihood though, for most people, caffeine probably has a minimal, effect, a minimal impact in the grand scheme of things. My suggestion is that you not try to quit coffee or caffeine during the initial phases of the diet. Once you've adapted to your new eating habits, give it a go if it's something you wanna take on. So now I'm going to read a few awesome tweets from Carnivore Aurelius. He's, uh, I guess, an influence that I suggest you follow. He's funny, witty, he says some really cool things, and he uh, has an awesome product that he sells as well, which are uh, beef liver crisps. So check out his website and pick those up if you get a chance. Coffee lovers rejoice. It doesn't interfere with fasting. It's ketogenic. It helps burn fat. I even heard that if you drink enough, you can talk to electricity. If you love it, don't give it up. 200 milligrams to 400 milligrams, human equivalent of caffeine a day, raised tea and DHT in rats by 68% and 57% respectively. Coffee is anabolic. Coffee is incredibly beneficial. It increases tea and DHT, has lots of magnesium, is associated with lower cancer risk, lower melanoma risk, improved longevity, lower Alzheimer's risk, improved liver function, increased insulin sensitivity, drink organic, low in mycotoxins. Caffeine stimulates CAMP, promoting STAR and testosterone synthesis. It also aids the liver with detox of estrogen. Coffee drinkers tend to have higher tea than non-coffee drinkers. All right, you guys, I've thrown you a ton of information. I've read from some amazing books from amazing doctors and specialists. It's basically up to you at this point. Is this something that you want to include in your carnivore diet? Do you want to get rid of it? What do you think about it? Uh, what are you guys doing? Drop it in the comment section below. And if you found any use in this video so far, just go ahead and hit that like button. I really appreciate it. And I'm going to send you a big thank you right now. Thank you. My suggestion is if you're going to continue to drink coffee, you might as well get the best coffee because I feel like if it's not organic and if it's not a high quality coffee, you're potentially uh, consuming pesticides and mycotoxins. Which brings me to my favorite coffee brand, which is Kion Coffee. Kion's a company that's co-founded by Ben Greenfield, another amazing biohacker guy, very health oriented, uh, very high integrity. Full disclosure, these guys sent me this free bag, but it's something that I've already had and something that I continue to use and purchase. Now, the cool thing with Kion is that they are giving our readers and viewers of Wild Lumens a 10% off discount site-wide. So go to Kion, and then when you're there, go ahead and type in Wild Lumens at checkout or use the link below. That's 10% off. They also give a 15% off discount for bundle packages and then a 20% discount on any subscription services that you sign up for. If you haven't, if you don't know this company by now and you're not familiar with them, go over there. There's plenty of information and amazing products to partake in and be sure to pick them up. Now, I don't want to mess this up. I want to read specifically why it might be a good idea to pick up Kion Coffee. Number one, it tastes fantastic, but there's some other reasons. It's certified organic. It's specialty grade. It's just the it's basically a fancy way of saying it's the best of the best. Tested for toxins, rigorously tested for things you'd rather not drink like pesticides, mold, yeast, and mycotoxins, and ethically sourced. Sourced from farms that meet the highest standards for ethical and sustainable practices. So for me, that's a no-brainer. Now that was a lot of information on caffeine and coffee and the carnivore diet. Be sure to get these books, be sure to get Kion, and be sure to tune in to the next episode of Wild Lumens, which should be coming out soon. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next episode.